Today on Grandworks, I build a media wall with custom cabling and custom wiring. Stay tuned. I wanted to hang a TV and a media console containing AV components in our family room, but wanted to do so without any visible wires. Furthermore, I didn't want to go to the common route of routing the AV cables through holes in the wall. Thus, everything needed to be custom. The wall started with just a single electrical outlet. The plan was to extend that to a recessed outlet higher in the wall which the TV can plug into. The second side of the recessed outlet was to contain a couple of HDMI ports, a USB port, and a set of composite RCA jacks. Further to the right will be a box containing banana plug speaker jacks for left, right, and center speakers which will be mounted on the wall. All of the AV connections are to be routed to a panel situated behind the media console. That panel will also have speaker jacks for any future surround sounds and subwoofers, plus the all-important ethernet jack and a coax connector. When done, the TV will be mounted on the wall completely hiding both panels behind it. Then, the speakers will be mounted besides and underneath the TV, thus hiding their own wires, and then the media console shall hide all of the lower bits. Everything will be controlled via an AVR. The top rack of the media console shall have game consoles and accessories, and then we'll round it out with a DVD player and a TiVo. All cables then have a specific place to go, and no wires or cables shall be visible. So let's get started. I do have all of the wall studs in SketchUp and so know the measurements of where they are, but just to make doubly sure, I tapped in small nails in the corners to ensure that there was nothing there but drywall. I then cut out the holes using the appropriate blade on my oscillating tool. This could be done in probably similar amounts of time with a jab saw, but I think the oscillating tool is more precise and it leaves a cleaner hole. And honestly, I just like using it better. Next up is removing the existing outlet since I'll be extending the wires from there. Now I have a constant audible reminder whenever the power is off and I'll let you hear it now. Yeah, that's the alarm on a nearby UPS that is impossible to silence. I'll mute all the rest of them in this video, but let it be known that every time you see me working on what could otherwise be hot wires that I'm hearing the fingernails on a chalkboard sounds of a UPS alarm. The wires were then simply capped off for the time being. The first AV cables I worked with are speaker wires. This is four conductor wire rated for in-wall use. I forget the exact gauge. 14 maybe? I had this left over from a previous project. I only needed two of the wires and so I snipped off the other two so that there wouldn't be any confusion after the fact. I also labeled both ends of each wire with a sharpie since I long ago learned the hard way that unlabeled wires all look exactly the same after they've been snaked through a wall or conduit. I only needed a low voltage box for the speaker wires and since my wire run is only a few feet in the same wall, well it's trivial to route the wires. It doesn't matter where the studs are either since this wall happens to be over a foot thick and so any wires can simply run behind the studs if necessary. The speaker plate I was using had jacks that could be connected via any of three ways. I could simply hand tighten the threaded post under the wire, or else I could solder the wire in place, or I could plug in the wire into the back using a banana plug. Now, soldering isn't worth the effort in this case, and I actually did try the banana plug method, but it turns out that you can only use one banana plug in a jack at a time, so it's either the one in the back or the one in the front. And since I wanted to use them for my speakers, well, that meant my only real option for the in-wall connection was the threaded post. Eh, easy peasy. The next order of business is essentially replicating the process on the sister speaker jacks on the other end. Care needed to be taken to match up the right colors to left and right, but that's about it. 
Note that there's also a speaker plate for the surround speakers and subwoofer, but since I don't yet have those for this room, they aren't actually hooked up to anything and are there more for our future considerations. These particular speaker plates were labeled, but were curiously labeled wrong in a couple cases. So I had to fix some of them with a Sharpie. With that done, I concentrated on the ethernet wire. Yeah, I do have Wi-Fi blanket in my house and it's pretty decent, but I'm kind of old school when it comes to networking. If I can have a hard line, I'm definitely going to do that with the hard line every single time. As it turns out, I have a switch in the room on the other side of this wall. And so all I needed was a small patch cable between two jacks on opposite sides of the same wall. I reused an existing unused Cat5e cable that I had lying around and just lopped off the jacks to make it in-wall ready. Hooking up Ethernet wire to a keystone jack is one of the easier custom wiring tasks out there. Just match up the colored wires with what the jack's instructions show and then push them down using the supplied tool. All that said, I have had enough bad experiences with bad ethernet connections to invest in a tester. One side hooks into the opposite jack and one side into the one I just did. And if everything lights up, well, I'm golden. This plate also has a keystone jack for coax. In my case, that's not for cable TV, but rather for the antenna in my attic. We canceled our cable TV more than two years ago and honestly, I've never missed it. I'm using 12 gauge wire for this extension, even though the circuit is technically a 15 amp circuit since, well, that's what I have and overkill's okay. I am just looping the wire behind the studs here, but um, yeah, I'll talk more about that later. The recess outlet I bought came with its own smart box brand outlet box. Those are pretty slick, but unfortunately they don't have anywhere near enough room to fit all the AV cables I was going to install on the low voltage side. So my next step was cutting out the back of the low voltage side with my oscillating tool. This is okay because the recess component itself actually has a plastic shield that separates the high voltage from the low voltage sides. I then use my utility knife to trim off the ragged edges. The electrical wire is pulled through one of the smart box's self-clamping holes. And I also made sure to leave uh, six or a little bit more inches exposed. The AV cables include two HDMI, one USB, and a set of composite RCA jacks. And those are simply threaded through the opening I had created. The smart box is then screwed into a nearby stud. Now this is the first time I've used this style of box that can be used for either old or new work instead of a dedicated old work box or new work box and I'll have to admit that I like them quite a bit. Um, they might actually be worth the extra money. Now this is the terminating connection and so the wiring is exceedingly straightforward. I strip off the insulating sheath back to the clamp and then strip off just enough on the hot and neutral wires to curve around the post on the outlet. I hook up the ground first and then whichever post is closest to me next. The way I remember which wire to hook to which post is via this saying, black connects to bronze. That is to say, the hot wire connects to the bronze screw and the neutral white wire to the remaining silver screw. The alliteration with the B's in black and bronze sticks in my mind for some reason. The AV cables now just plug into the back of the keystone jacks on the panel. No special splicing is needed. Trivial. I screw the plate into the outlet box and voila, my two upper boxes are done. The lower jacks are just more of the same as the upper jacks. In fact, believe it or not, the hardest part of this step was finding the four gang low voltage bracket in the first place. It wasn't available locally anywhere, 
and it was even trickier than I expected to find online without egregious shipping. Who knew? Oh, and remember I talked about the necessity of labeling the speaker wires since they look the same on the opposite end? Well, guess which wires I didn't label in this set. Yeah, the two HDMI wires. I couldn't remember which was one and which was two, so I just guessed and hooked one up to one of the jacks and the other up the other. But yeah, you guessed it, I guessed wrong. And so I ended up having to redo these two jacks after the fact. Yeah, anytime you're going to have more than one type of the same wire, absolutely need to label them. Now on to the wiring. Okay, so my extension wire is not in any kind of raceway, nor is it stapled to the studs within one foot of either of those outlet boxes as the NEC 334.30 dictates. That said, I read and reread that section and I think I'm in the clear based on 334.30 clause B, which states that the cable may be unsupported if it is fished between access points through concealed spaces where adding support is impractical. Well, that's precisely what I did here. So I think I'm good. Very technically speaking, I could have connected up my outlet serially with the wires since each outlet does have two sets of posts and thus I could change them together. Installing them in parallel is quite a bit more work, but well, I do always think it's worth doing, so I do it whenever possible. What this essentially entails is separating the hot, neutral, and ground, and then for each of them, connecting up the incoming wire, the extension wire, and then two pigtails into one bundle. For me, the part of this that takes the most time is connecting up the pigtails to the other two wires. Now, yeah, I'm sure that the pros can do this in their sleep. But for me, it's always a bit of a struggle to get them all twisted up together in the first place. As a matter of habit, I do always leave my wires a little bit long so that I can snip off the ends of the wires that were marred by the grips of my linesman players. All that done, I'm left with two separate sets of ground, hot, and neutral wires. That makes hooking up the outlets themselves practically child's play. Black to bronze, white to silver, ground to ground. I'm using the pro grade outlets from Home Depot, which I love. Why? Well, because I don't need to twist the wires around a post like with cheaper outlets, nor do I have to push the wires into a hole which may or may not actually lock into place. Usually not. Instead, the Pro Outlet allows you to insert the still straight wire between two metal plates that are then tightened down with the terminal screws, thus securely clamping the wire into place. This results in a rock solid connection while being much easier to use in the cheaper models. It's well worth the extra few dollars as far as I'm concerned. With the power back on, and no more maddening UPS beeping, I verified that each one registered a solid 120 volts. Cool. The custom wiring and cabling is done, so now it's time for the TV mount. I already know where the studs are, but to find the centers of them, I use an old magnet left over from my days of having to have childproof drawers and cabinets. Magnets are by far the most reliable way of finding studs that I know of. I mark out where I can screw into the studs and then position the TV mount over those positions, ensuring that the mount is level. I then pre-drill for the first hole, and then drive in a hefty lag bolt. I tighten it just enough so that the frame stays into place naturally, but can still be moved a little bit. That little bit is to ensure that I can re-level the mount before marking, drilling, and driving in the second lag bolt, which then really seals it into place. Both of those are then firmly tightened down. The other two bolts are done in exactly the same way.
When done, this mount is incredibly strong. 